So today we're going to see word embeddings, which are actually one of the things that revolutionize um, uh, NLP. Uh, they are being used in every um, NLP talk. And understanding of word embeddings is really important. So uh, in the previous chapter, we have seen how we use um, uh, several textual system talks, like top word tenure and tokenization. And the reason why we do them basically was to uh, try to put our text data in a good way that we can do modeling. So today we're gonna see um, word embedding, which is also in some sense um, uh, representation learning or word, um, word vector mapping. Uh, maybe we can see also text processing um, pipeline. So we're gonna see these are some of the learning objectives. Um, what these are sparse matrix and dense, why sparse matrix not good fit for uh, modeling, and we'll see different kind of work vector representation. Then we're gonna see um, what embedding without pre-trained models and what embedding with pre-trained vectors. So first and first, what um, sparse matrix are. So a sparse matrix, which you know from our Math 101 um, are basically a matrix with um, mostly the content um, zeros, uh, while a dense matrix is one in which um, the content of the matrix are not actually zero. But how can we say a matrix is dense or is sparse? So we use um, uh, a formula for sparsity to find um, the percentage that is the count of zero all of our total element in the uh, matrix. So um, when we find this uh, percentage, a sparsity ratio, um, if, uh, the, uh, if the ratio of this uh, is less than 0 0.5, then the matrix is so sparse. So this is uh, one thing that we can determine, um, yeah, the, our matrix is sparse. So this is basically the idea of what sparse is and what dense matrix is. So we can see here, this is a dense matrix and this is a sparse matrix um so but th th there are issues with sparse matrix in uh, uh modeling or nlp in general uh, uh, in nutshell all large matrix uh or seems to be um sparse and there are many ways uh, matrices uh, are formed to form Pass. One way is one hot encoding, count encoding, TFID, and other ways in NLP. This is a way to, in which uh, we form a sparse matrix. But um, as we know in our modeling uh, machine learning, some machine learning algorithm, they need some kind of uh, data to be in some kind of representation, right? Uh, some they need you to do some kind of reprocessing, some need you not. Uh, so also tree-based algorithms do not perform better with sparse input. So if you give your machine learning algorithm, uh, uh, the data is sparse, then it will not perform better. This means uh, we need to turn our matrix from sparse into some representation that the learning algorithm will learn better, such as um, dense. So also, as you know, as the size of the corpus increase in terms of what other to sparsity increase. So when we have, many words in the documents uh, we have many documents so the more we have the most sparsity increase and this actually introduced the problem of space and time complexity uh, what we mean by space is this uh, this is one of the example for uh, mat large matrix that is uh, too heavy an example of very large matrix that is too large to be stored in memory is a link matrix that shows the link from one website to another. So you can see if we have a particular website that it shows some links to another, maybe 1 million. So this is very, very large sparse matrix because it will be many zeros. Uh, an example of smaller sparse matrix may be a word term occurrence matrix word in one book against all non-dictionary words. So you can see here, uh, this is a matrix uh, also is smaller, not like this one, but also this one will be um, sparse. So why the problem with this is uh, sparse matrix in general, uh, in terms of space, is that we need to represent... Oh, 
โอเคเลยเรา join ไปแบบ iPad so the problem with in, in terms of space is that all these zero locations in the matrix need to be represented in 32 bit or 64 bit representation in the matrix which is actually a waste of memory uh, space but today now the space is, doesn't matter but um, it's still uh, something uh, so not only that pre-processing with this large zero also take time this is also uh, computationally expensive so these are some of the problem two problem with sparse matrix uh, which are space and time consuming and uh, we need to get away with this uh, especially in text processing so this is an example in nlp sparsity so if we have for example document time matrix like this um, we may have uh, the presentation here as we can see here we have two three sentences you can see this is very sparse this is just a very simple example and we can see that um it's really sparse and as we know uh in nlp given a text the computer does not actually understand text we need to convert this text to numbers right so this is one way we spell uh, text vectorization so we can see even this small number when working with document text in NLP, we must develop special line measures address sparsity directly as the input data is almost always sparse. Because as we can see here from this very example, the this is so sparse. So if, for example, we have 100 words in a language model, then the future vector has a length of 100. So we have 100,000. We're going to have 100,000, but for short smell email message, almost all the features will have count zero. So this is um, very, uh, a very simple example. We can see that uh, if we have 100,000 words in the language, then it means here will be 100, right? Uh, will be 100 uh, from one to um, 100,000. But if having a single email or two email, this will be very sparse. So uh, this process of converting words to uh, numbers generally is refers to as vectorization. So this is called vectorization. Uh, the solution to representing and working with sparse matrix is to use alternate data structure to represent sparse data. So we can see that um, we cannot go away with sparsity in NLP or in text analysis. The data is always sparse. But how can we solve this issue of sparsity? Because as you can see here, it's so sparse. An example here, given words like 100,000 words in a language, and we have a single email to email, it will be sparse. Now, how can we deal with this part? So the best way to deal with sparse is representing and working with sparse matrix is to use alternate data structure to represent sparse data. So that's the only way. We need to use alternate data structure to represent this sparse data. data. Uh, so linguistics um, computer scientists have worked on vector models for language that can reduce the number of dimensions representing text data on how people use the language. This kind of dense word vector are often called word embeddings. So as you can see here, we have sparsity here, it's very sparse. Now, how can we represent this sparse matrix into a representation, project this representation into a vector or representation that is not sparse? Now, projecting sparse matrix to a representation that is not sparse, but dense representation leads us to vector that is often called word embeddings. Um, so if you look at this, for example, this one, no. if you look at this example here, so this, uh, for example, we have cat, we have kids, something like this. And if you look at this one here, we have these words, right? And here we have word embeddings. So you can see this one, each cat is represented as word vectors, but each one contains some value representation. Now, if we map this one as a matrix, all this one, you can see this is not a sparse, but a dense vector. And if you can see here, um, also this one here, if you look at this one here, everything here contains some words. So this is dense. 
these war embeddings, they have been quite question. Yes. Yes. Hello, Leila, you have a question? Yeah, yeah, you can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I was asking, what did you mean by it's a, it's a dense vector? Ah, so what I'm saying is, um, we have not yet go to um, that, um, the embeddings, I'm just giving the idea. So what I'm saying is this, so if we look at this, um, this is um, sparse matrix, right? And we can see here like each, row is a vector, right? It's a vector, right? Um, each, so, but this one is a dense matrix. So it means that each row is populated with everything. Each row, we have values. There is no zero, 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 zero. But what about this one? We have many zeros, it's, it's passed. Now in NLP, if you look at it here, this is pass. This is a pass. What I mean by this is that um, we, if we, if we assume this is a matrix, this is a sparse in the sense that we have, for example, document here, this word about it's not represented, but here zero. So if we have large representation of word, this will be very, very sparse. Now, how can we change this representation to be dense? That is everywhere that it's value. It's not zeros. How can we have some kind of representation in NLP that is not sparse matrix representation, but a dense representation? That will not, um, um, the dense representation will contain some kind of many other things, but of course this one is not like um, word embedding um, for uh, text vectorization. But if you can see here, there is no relationship between bad and about. There is no relationship between hard and bad. There is no relationship between is and hard. There is no relationship between the and word here. There isn't any, it's just word with their occurrence. But we want, we want a representation whereby this is a word and this is a word. We want to a representation whereby there is some kind of values here and these values is representing represented with some kind of similarity. This is related to this, some similarity. So if this is related to this, something like this 0 0.6, 0 0.9, some stuff like that, you know what I mean? So um, that's where we said here, um, the process of combining word back into, is called vectorization like this, combining words into word into word, words into numbers. But the solution to representing and working with past matrix is to use alternate data structure to represent sparse data. Now we have sparse data. What is the solution for us to solve this sparse data? Is to use alternate data structure, An alternate representation. When we say data structure, means alternate representation, so that the representation is not sparse. So there are many um, data structure to uh, represent dense matrix, but what we are talking now is we want to move into embeddings. So he said linguistics and computer have worked on vector model for language. So this is vector model, some ways, vector model. This is some way we say vector model. What we mean by vector model is that um, uh, if we say this about this is the representation because it's a vector. So the vector is one zero, the, uh, it contains this. So computer have worked on vector model for language that can reduce the number of dimension representing text data based on how people use language. This kind of work, dense vectors are often called word embeddings. So um, there have been quite development over the last couple of decades using word embedding for neural models. Uh, recent development include contextualized word embedding, leading cutting edge models like VAD. So the word embeddings are of different kinds. They are what we call contextualized word embeddings. What they mean contextualized is that they understand the context, what embedded, they understand what is behind this, what is this, what is, they understand, they can represent context. They can understand the context, we'll see more of them, but just here I'm trying to introduce the notion of how the sparsity is introduced. So we can see here, uh, for example, uh, if we assume this as a somehow kind of beta representation, you can see it's not sparse, there is no zero, every 
representation. Every here, there is some values that represent something, right? So you can see here, uh, uh, there are many ways um, to, okay, these are the words, these are the embeddings, but um, what embeddings can be used in different ways? Number one, what embedding can be used for, to find similarity, to find similar word? What embedding can use, be used for test classification? So for example, for, to find similar word, you can see this one is 7D dimension, right? One, two is 7D dimension. Now we can map this 7D to 2D and now look at some representation here. So you can see here, we can use some kind of distance measure to find a similar word, right? So when we map this from 7D to 2D, and now we present it, we, uh, we uh, project it in this way, we can use some kind of edit dis and distance measures to find which word is closer to another. And then we can find similarity. So you can see here, we find some kind of similarity, visualizing word embedding in, word embedding in 2D. Here we do dimensionality reduction. Here we project the 7D to 2D. So for example, after words are converted as vectors, here we converted this to vectors, we need to use some techniques such as Euclidean descent cosines to identify similar words. So you can see here, we project them to from 7D to some stuff like that, and now we uh, use some. So this is one of the uh, uh, application of word embedding to find similar words together. Hold um, on, so let me, let me understand really quick. So I understand that this is a vector of similarity scores. So you have, <laughs> 0.9 similarity from between cat and feline. Mm -hmm. But to get a, this vector from seven dimensions down to two dimensions, I, one of the dimensions is a similarity score. What is, what do you, what is the other? The thing, the words? You say what? What is the, uh, what is the second dimension? No, I mean, if you, we have a vector like this, um, ND, um, yeah, we can uh, map it to any uh, dimension we need, right? Um, using maybe PCA or some stuff like that. Um, we have techniques to map uh, n dimension to particular dimension, right? Uh, Justin, am I right? Um, one of the way to map uh, n dimension to particular dimension is to use um, PCA, right? Yeah, PCA, right? Yeah, I, I get that that's, I mean, PC is one of the common tools used for dimensionality reduction for, mm -hmm. for features for machine learning models. But yeah. like in this particular for word embeddings, I don't know, because it's completely new, I'm not sure if the same thing, the same kind of methods are used to uh, reduce dimensions because like oh. how, because you know that these are like similar. So like see how close cat and kitten are? is because they have very close similarity scores. So cat is um, uh, 0.9 and 0.8 feline. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm trying to say? Like, I don't know. Yeah, so. I, I don't know how it got, it got from this uh, four by seven matrix to uh, this scatter plot. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think um, it's me that um, maybe just into. So here I just introduced it to uh, show the introduction of uh, how sparse matrix is, is this. Uh, maybe we can discuss this more on how this is mapped in when we come to the embeddings, uh, how to calculate the embeddings, the details of the embeddings. Yeah. Right. So this is just um, sparsity in NLP. Uh, and why sparsity, what, how do we deal with the sparsity? So to deal with the sparsity is to map uh, sparse to some kind of representation that is not sparse. So let's move on. So what vector representation? So um, as we can see, uh, or as we, can, uh, we saw is that uh, what embeddings are nothing but numerical representation of text. Uh, we represent uh, our text in some kind of numerical ways. Uh, but there are many ways to do vector representation, word vector representation. Uh, there are pre-word embedding error, uh, which is basically frequency or statistical based word embedding. And there are modern word embeddings error. So pre-word embedding, that is when we use count vector, TFDI uh, vectorization, co-occurrence and fixed concepts, these are free word embedding errors. 
we create a um, world vector representation with those, uh, this approach. And we have more than word embedding error, where we have prediction based on word embeddings approach like uh, CBAO, skip grab models. So what we're gonna see now is we see um, these uh, uh, representations, um, then we can move and see these uh, modern word embeddings. Um, yeah, Justin, anything you wanna add? Leila, anything you wanna add before we proceed? Okay, right. Um, count vector. So this is very simple um, uh, frequency count, right? Uh, to show um, how uh, our words are represented. Uh, that is word vector. So here using um, one data set, the plain uh, complaint, stuff like that. We have many documents in them. And as you can see here, we nest them, join, remove stop word, and stem the, stem the text, and now count them and cast them into the uh, document frequency matrix, right? Um, so here we have this. Um, so if you, so I think, oh, here, I also reduced the uh, slice, the number of uh, uh, complaint because it was large, it's taking a long time. So I just like to take some part. So we can see here, um, we have 7,752 features, right? Uh, these are the features. Um, uh, and of course, as you can see, uh, it's 99.2 for sparse, right? So you can see this is a very sparse um, representation, right? And these are the document, document this, document this, you know, this is the document number, and these are some of the words in the uh, stuff. So um, this gives us a sparse matrix, right? And this is not what we need. Uh, as I said, um, we need a representation that actually uh, projects past matrix to non sparse, but we need dense representation. So this uh, is one of the ways uh, classical. Um, word vector, uh, which is count. So uh, we need a better approach. So one way again is um, weighted count, TF IDF or TF IDF vectorization, uh, which improves uh, the previous one. And I think, was it Jens, uh, Justin or Laila that talked to us on the previous session, uh, our book? Laila, why are you or Justin? No, oh, okay, Justin. It was right. Justin. Right. But I so, did this also in the in the other book. <laughs> ah, which yeah. book? The one we, we did before this, the text mining with R. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm talking about text mining with R. Yeah, that, yeah, I presented on TF Idea. Yeah, okay. So, what, um, should I leave you to present this session? No, I'm good. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. So, the, the next one is we can represent our text data using sparse matrix where elements are weighted rather than the straightforward count, right? So the previous one is fast, but the presented is using fast, but we can use TF IDF. We already know TF IDF as well. So we don't need to go that. And uh, you can see here, uh, we bind it using uh, TF IDF, uh, right? And still we can see here, we have these features, right? Um, the same features, this is number of decimal, which is 99.24% um, sparse. Still this is sparse. Um, still, our final data structure is incredibly sparse and of high dimensionality with huge number of features, right? Um, so this will uh, actually delay our um, uh, take more huge space and time. And also here is one of the representation from the book. I just grabbed the picture. Um, I look at the code and um, it, gives you, it was giving me an error and uh, I just copied the picture. Um, so here, what they were saying is, um, is intuitively true. Um, at the size of the corpus increase in terms of word, while the second both sparsity and RAM required to hold the corpus in memory increase. So we can see here, um, this is uh, the RAM and this uh, the unique number of words. So here we have like 3,000. So at the number increase, we can see the sparsity increase. So you can see here, it reaches like uh, the sparsity increase and approaches 100%. Uh, here in this case. So the memory required to restore the corpus increase with the square of the number of tokens. So also the RAM. So you can see here, uh, 100, okay, uh, 300, 3,000. So this, as they said, the, it increases um, uh, exponentially in a nutshell, so, uh, which is um, non-economical. So, Linguist, oh, this is the oh, this is uh, what I have already shown. Oh, I didn't 
Oh, okay. So uh, this, uh, um, we don't want this approach as well. So we have seen the first one, which is this. So we said, we're gonna see count vector, GF, IDF, and this, as we saw, they are actually very, very sparse. This one is also sparse. And we're gonna see this one, uh, how it, oh, it's not there in the book. Oh, okay, I didn't, right, it's not there in the book. Okay. So, um, what embeddings? So um, this is uh, where we're gonna discuss about the modern wire embeddings uh, because the previous um, uh, the previous uh, uh, pre word embedding errors they are actually sparse they are word vector representation but they are mainly sparse they don't make any uh, make uh, intuitive use for uh, our NLP tasks so we're gonna look at the word embeddings so. Uh, but for the word embeddings, uh, we're gonna see two ways to represent them. Uh, one is word embedding without pre-trained vectors, and word embeddings with pre-trained vectors. So what mean this, what this means is that you can create word embeddings from scratch with just without using uh, anything. But there is what we call pre-trained vectors. So these pre-trained vectors are word embeddings that have been pre-trained uh, by many uh, NLP like blog, word to bag, you need not to um, uh, train to create, to train word, be uh, word vectors, you just download them and use them. They are off the shelf, you know what I mean? So you don't need to do that. So uh, the book actually start working with um, the first one, which is uh, uh, how can we create word embeddings without return vectors? So for example, you are in clinical or some kind of uh, domain that there isn't, any existing word pre-trained word embeddings, then you can create your own word embedding using this one. But if you are working in general sense, like maybe Twitter or some data that um, general corpus, then you can just use word embedding, pre-trained word embedding uh, to do your analysis. Um, yeah, so let's move on. Um, right, so, I think uh, this is where I didn't run the <laughs> because it takes long time. So I have a question, Justin. Um, as you said, also you started running this, uh, it crashed your computer. Is there any way to, when I run, for example, a code like the chunk that I can capture the result so that when I rerun the markdown, the result here, because it's computationally expensive, it will, it will not rerun it, it will just, put Remove, uh, give me the result. Is there any way to do that? Layla is shaking her head yes, very furiously. So she should respond to that. I'll just briefly say, I think cache equals true will do it sometimes. I found that it's very finicky. So sometimes I notice that some calculations are still going. I don't consider myself an R markdown expert. So maybe, so I hope that Layla will maybe tell us the conditions. Typically what I do is I would save the result to an object. Mm -hmm. That's what I would do. I would save tidy PMI to an object and then not, not actually execute the code when I render the R markdown, but just load it up, load into my environment tidy PMI. That's what I would do in general, as opposed to the cache equals true. But anyway, that's, Man, that's my piece you, on this. Your solution? Um, Basically, what Justin said, there's a there's a way. Um, I remember we were having this. Uh, oh, you were there in the tidy models book club. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those. Uh, there's there's I have may, maybe I'll post it in the Slack afterward. I have some um, YAML like chunk that will store the output and like any like visualizations into a folder. <laughs> And I've never had issues with it before, but I think the what Justin recommended as like saving the data set in a data folder or something and then calling that instead and just commenting out the code may be like a, a good backup solution um, or first solution mm -hmm. if you don't want to use cache. Mm -hmm. wow. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I can post that, that code from that other, I didn't know about that until the Tidy Mops book club. Um, 
last summer. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, Justin, as I said, I think I will stop here. I will continue from here next week um, so that we can continue because I didn't run this uh, actually. Uh, so this is where I stop, but uh, I will continue next week from this session. Yep. All right. Sounds good. It's pretty dense stuff. They make a cool. lot of custom, custom functions. Yeah. And oh, I didn't even understand this one, Justin. Um. <laughs> well, now, oh, now yeah. you have a, now you have a week to understand it. So it's. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So in my own, in my own notes, what I did was I actually like any time I saw. So I've never used slide before. Uh, so I actually like made notes about how to use slide. So anytime I would see it, basically anytime I saw a new function like slide or some of the wide and like the point wise uh, yeah, information, I like would uh, just make little notes to myself. So it's, it took made reading uh, take quite a long time because I'd have to stop every time I saw something new, make like a little appendix on my notes and then go back up to the main text. So yeah, me not too. easy. Yeah, um, uh, I, <laughs> the thing is, I didn't, the reason why I didn't finish the chapter, I started doing, because I was quite busy, I started doing the chapter today. And um, yeah, it took me like, uh, um, uh, and I was working and uh, yeah. So, sorry about that. Um, I think I will finish it next week. Sounds good. All right. Um, so, um, Justin, and Leila, we have next chapter. Who sign up? Oh, we have think, one more week. I was gonna say, I think I'm I might have signed up, but in any case, I guess I'm not presenting next week. It's gonna oh yeah. Okay, okay. It's gonna be you. Who oh yes, yeah, yes, yeah, sure. yes. All right. So that sounds good. So um let me stop presenting. Okay. So um, I think um, we can see next week if there's nothing to talk. Yeah. Okay. Is there a lot of chapter five left? Yeah, there's like most of it left. Oh, this is just the beginning. Oh, man. Yeah, we signed up for the wrong chapter. But it's okay. Better you than me. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Yeah, this, this is just the beginning, actually. But I will finish it next week. I was like trying to say, oh no, let's meet next week. But I said, no, we must meet. I must talk what I have. <laughs> yeah, if that is just the beginning and it took like over 30 minutes to get through, then yeah, we we'll probably have to split this chapter anyways. So that means that's going to push back everything a week. So let yeah. me, because I signed up for, I think, the following chapter. So, okay, that's good to know. I need to remark it on my calendar. All right. Okay, so thank you all for joining and we'll see you next week.